Hello, I'm with Hans Joachim Vogt. Uh, he is a professor of economics at uh, UPF in uh, Barcelona and also an INET grantee. Uh, Hans Joachim, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to be interviewed by us. Thanks so much for having me. Um, you're in a very interesting position because uh, you, you're German, but you live in uh, Barcelona. So um, let's just say that you see uh, you, uh, you have a unique perspective of the uh, European Monetary Union crisis. So why don't you um, elaborate on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm in the fortunate position of not yet being pelleted by toma rotten tomatoes from my students. Um, but yes, it's an interesting position to be in. So if you're German and you live in Spain, the first thing that happens is that your phone rings nonstop because journalists want to know from Germany and elsewhere um, how things are, how people are reacting to what is seen as German-imposed austerity. And that's certainly becoming much more of a hot-button issue in the last year in Spain. And uh, in, in fact, uh, the, the German-imposed austerity, uh, it, it, you, you've actually been one of the, the, the more eloquent critics against that. Um, it, it's not a popular position that you've taken in Germany, uh, but you have also, you've been pointed out, and I think uh, very rightly so, uh, that there's increasing strains that are developing all across the continent as a result of these policies. And yet that, doesn't, that view doesn't seem to be getting any kind of traction in Berlin. So I think if you think about the ability to service debt, and most of Southern Europe has a debt problem, then we always talk about this as economists and on the part of German politicians as if this is a technical problem, as if there's a certain amount of debt that simply mechanically needs to be serviced, you need a primary surplus figure to do that, and once we hit it, we're done. And the thing we seem to forget and neglect is that it's mostly the willingness to pay rather than the ability to pay that determines whether these debts can be serviced. And every country has a breaking point. The US has one, Germany has one, Spain, Italy, and Greece have uh, breaking points too, By breaking where, the level point. of, where the level of austerity becomes yes. so painful okay. that the political system can no longer actually deliver it. And do you um, think we're at that point now? I think we're getting very close to it, yeah. and I think we don't really know where it is. So it's clear that we hit it in Greece. Yeah. Um, I think we might be getting there in Spain. We're headed towards 30% unemployment. Youth unemployment is above 50%. You have to take these figures with a pinch of salt in the sense that even in periods of full employment, the stated unemployment figures were around seven or eight in Spain. But there's clearly a lot of major social disruption. The number of people going through garbage bins, sleeping rough, and so forth, the size of demonstrations, the sense of desperation is something that we haven't seen in Europe since the 1930s. And of course, Spain has an additional complicating factor, which is uh, unique to that country in the sense that you also have uh, incipient separatist moves, not only in, in, in Catalonia, but of course you've historically had the Basque problem as well. That's right. So <clears throat> Spain has a very interesting political setup at the moment in the sense that it has regions that think of themselves as culturally different that clearly have distinct histories and a history of self-governance. And they're mostly the biggest net payers into the common Spanish pot. So if you think about that in a European perspective, the typical thing is that a region that wants to break away, say Scotland or southern Tyrol, they get bribed to stay. That's the normal thing. And in Spain, you have to pay for the privilege to be part of a larger entity that you do not care to participate in at all. And that's not sustainable politically. That's not how Europeans do things. And Catalans are rightly up in arms about this. And in fact, the, the, the separatist uh, parties, I think, can now have a majority in the regional parliament, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so there are people who believe in the right to choose, and that's something like 80% of the vote. And then of these, most of them are actually in favor of Catalan independence, so that's a little bit more than two-thirds. But we've discussed this earlier, and the, the, the difference, say, uh, I'm Canadian, and so I've, I've, I've compared it to the, uh, the, the, the Quebec experience, but you, you pointed out that there is a, a difference in... in, in Quebec, if the Quebecois decide they've got a majority, even to say 50.1%, that they want to separate, they can, they can have a vote and we can have negotiations about it. But Spain's a little bit different in that regard. Yes, I think there's a consensus in most mature democracies that if a region feels so strongly that they want to break away, we let them break away. That's what's going to happen in Scotland with a referendum on independence. That's what happened in Quebec. Whereas the Spanish position is very much that you can decide whatever you want. Basically, Catalonia is a conquered territory. Uh, conquered in 1714, and the Catalans can decide and vote whatever they like. They have to stay with a different political entity, even against their wishes. 
And if you ask me, that's a form of colonialism. And, and to what extent has that been exacerbated by the economic stress that the country's been experiencing as a whole? Because Catalonia is a very wealthy region. Hmm. It's a very well, one of the wealthiest regions. Uh, it's as wealthy as the Basque region. Now, the Basque region, because it has a history of terrorism, is actually not asked to contribute to the common Spanish pot on anywhere like the same scale. The biggest net payer is Catalonia. Mm -hmm. And the downturn clearly made things much, much worse. So Catalonia always thought it had a rough deal, and I think objectively speaking that's true. It pays a lot in taxes, has very few infrastructure, every single road is a toll road, every road around Madrid is actually free, and so on. Now, you actually have this very fragile political equilibrium in Spain. If you think about the home region of our prime minister, Galicia, there's about 2 million inhabitants, and 700,000 of these are unemployed. Add in the old age pensioners, and you realize that every bit of economic activity in this region is basically a result of a transfer from the rest of Spain. Mm -hmm. You pull out the biggest net payer, and this entire political equilibrium of politicians saying, vote for me, I get the pork from Madrid, you're going to be fine, starts to fall apart. And of course, on the Catalan side, the downturn meant that you're no longer having to pay a little bit too much, but money is actually so scarce, and it's very scarce in terms of, say, hospital resources, um, funding for public schools, public safety, and so forth, it's very, very painful to see these huge net transfers to the rest of Spain. And the worrying concern is that um, Spain has been um, making serious efforts on the fiscal austerity side. They, they, they've been making quite substantial cuts already. Um, now, they've, they, of course, under the OMT, the outright monetary transactions uh, policy announced last summer by uh, ECB President Mario Draghi, uh, if Spain uh, decides to accede to the program under which the ECB would effectively backstop their debt, they're going to have to do so with, the, um, with more conditionality and for conditionality read austerity. And the concern, of course, is that the next uh, thing that's going to be attacked is the public pension fund system, which is the last major prop for income support in the country. So that must get you uh, pretty close to the breaking point, I would think, uh, in, as far as Spain goes. Yeah, so Spain, I think, is an interesting case where you sort of see in slow motion something that we've seen in Greece as well, where every year the government says the deficit's too high, we're going to cut expenditure, we're going to hit our deficit figures, bringing it down last year, the plan from 8 to 5. And as a result of cutting as much expenditure as they do, economic activity slumps, tax revenue is much lower than expected, and you end up with the same deficit figure that you had before, but a smaller economy. And because it worked so well, we're going to do the same thing again this year. And you're right, if they actually, the Spaniards graciously allow themselves to be rescued, and they're having a bit of a power game over this, then there's more conditionality down the line. Well, it's an elaborate game of bluff, and, and of course, with what's happened in Cyprus, uh, one wonders uh, whether that's going to trigger yet more deposit flight, which will, in fact, uh, force Spain under the, uh, the ECB's um, um, friendly arm, shall we say. <laughs> that's an excellent point you raise, Marshall, because... Cyprus, so far, I think, has not loomed large in the minds of Spanish savers. And that's a bit surprising. And I think it's one of these things that might be slow motion, that you don't see much of a reaction in the beginning. But gradually, I think it's going to change the way people think about the safety of financial institutions. Until now, we've worked very hard to convince people to keep their pennies in banks. Uh, the holders of preference shares in Spain have had a very rough deal recently to deal with. And that, in conjunction with the Cyprus deal, where for the first time we've actually said, you know, money in banks may not be safe, better think about it, could actually easily lead to the next source of major financial instability in Europe. And the preference share uh, policy is a very interesting one because, of course, th these preference shares were sold to Spanish depositors, as I understand it, as being as virtually as good as, as deposits, uh, they're, they're going to be safe. And then, of course, the banks get into trouble and effectively the, these people are being forced to take mandatory haircuts, much like the uninsured depositors in Cyprus. That's exactly right. So these were basically sold to people like savings deposits just with a higher yield. Um, the banks guarantee that they would always be sold and, at, and taken back at par. And what they actually did was not that the bank took the other side of the deal, but they'd just find another saver who wanted to buy if you were the saver that wanted to sell. And this is a result of poor lax regulation. So at some point, the Bank of Spain stepped in and said, you can't do this anymore. And all of a sudden, the price of these preference shares fell to their market value, which is about 40 cents on the euro. So as a result, even if your bank is still in business, you've lost about half, and then some of these banks have gone out of business, and the people who thought that they had simple savings deposits have lost everything that they put into the savings vehicle. Is there actually a deposit insurance scheme 
in uh, Spain as there is in the other uh, European Union countries. Yes, Spain has the standard. And it's 100,000. Yes, um, up to 100,000 everything is guaranteed, but of course, as we learned the painful way, all of these guarantees are only worth as much as the promises of politicians. And these are the same politicians who said no Eurozone country will ever go bankrupt. And, and of course, there is an additional problem because, of course, when you, when you have a deposit insurance guarantee in the U.S. or in Canada, for example, it's much more credible because ultimately it's backed by, uh, say, in the U.S., uh, the FDIC is ultimately backstopped by the Treasury. So you have the, 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 uh, the government behind that guarantee. Um, and, and the same thing in Canada. Um, the, the problem we saw in countries like Cyprus and Ireland is that when you have a banking systems which are multiples of GDP, and you make a deposit insurance guarantee, even if it's only to 100,000 euros per head, if uh, those banking assets are, say, you know, four or 500, or in the case of Cyprus, 700% of GDP, you can't make it credibly, it seems to me, without the, uh, the ultimate uh, backstop of the ECB. And that's not there yet. I think that's exactly right. So without the willingness of the central bank to just monetize the debt and make the promise stick, I think it's very hard to convince people that the uh, bank deposits are safe. But that's, a, that's a, a political hurdle too far in places like Germany. There, there is absolutely no support, is my understanding, for uh, an ECB-backed European-style FDIC. Hmm. <clears throat> well, whether there's support or not, at the end of the day, I think doesn't matter half as much as we like to think it does. Uh, every single promise that Germans were made before they agreed to monetary union has been broken. This is the last one standing, and we can wait and see whether that's actually going to be broken as well. And in fact, uh, the, 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 I would say that uh, with the introduction of capital controls, you already have, in effect, a, a, a breakage in, in, the, in the monetary union, because now you have no longer just non-stop free convertibility. You effectively have a two-tier currency system now. I mean, a, a, a Cypriot euro is only worth, a, 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 say, a German euro up to 5,000 euros. And then beyond that, it's it maybe in the free market, it, it might be a one-to-one, -one, close to one-to-one -one parity with the dollar. Um, Yes, that's exactly right. And of course, the open question that nobody has an answer to is how long is this going to go on for? If it's a temporary thing, it takes a month, it takes two to resolve it and everything is back to normal, we'll probably forget it as a small blip on the radar screen. But exiting capital controls once you have them tends to be very, very tricky. And if I'm a Spanish depositor and I see that there's a, a chance that uh, uh, Prime Minister Rajoy's administration ultimately does have to go under the aegis of the uh, ECB's program, then I would think that uh, that could very well accelerate deposit flight, as seemed to be in, in evidence um, last spring, for example. Yeah, so the, last year there was real panic in Spain, and I had colleagues calling me saying, you know, who is your bank in Germany? Do you have a phone number for me? I need to do something. We're not at these panic levels yet, but as we know, these things can change overnight, often in response to almost no news at all. One final question, because um, Spain is an also, is also an illus interesting illustration of a country where you didn't really have a problem of so-called public profligacy, which seems to be the German um, uh, identification of the, of the core problems behind the crisis. You had a country that had largely, uh, it, its budget was largely in balance, and it seemed to be the product of a property bubble, a private sector debt bubble. So one wonders whether the, the, uh, um, the wholesale advocacy of fiscal austerity is, is the wrong diagnosis for a disease which is actually very, very different. I think that's exactly right. I mean, when this crisis started, Spain's public debt to GDP level was about half of the German level. It was tiny. We've spent a decade repaying debt. So this is not the source of the problem in Spain. What happened was that Spain lost competitiveness as a result of this huge property bubble because they had a financial system and savers and investors that didn't know how to deal with very low interest rates. And the central bank that did nothing to stop an incredible party in the real estate sector. And as a result, when the competitiveness was lost and unit labor costs surged, Spain basically became uncompetitive. And for a while, you didn't see this in the markets because Spain could still borrow at very low rates and cover its current account deficit in that way. And once that music stopped, once you could no longer actually just import capital to cover your deficit and the uh, balance of payments, what <coughs> happened then was that you now need to actually regain competitiveness by lowering wages, lowering prices. We know that in countries and economies as rigid as Spain, with a lot of nominal stickiness, this directly translates into very high rates of unemployment, very low capacity utilization, huge drops in nominal GDP. And that's what we've got today. That's what we've got I've, today. On that sad note, I think we're going to have to uh, leave it there. So thank you very much for uh, agreeing you. to speak to us. Appreciate it.